Yes. Um, I'm not clear about um, Hemos, um studies with the anesthesia. Um, I don't. I don't know. My belief is that the anesthesia doesn't take away the consciousness completely. So. Is that what he's coming up with? Hamroff would completely disagree with you. Really? It, it does. Yeah. It does. Oh, yeah. Wow. No wonder we're so vulnerable. We are very vulnerable. Okay. Yes, back here. Pardon? Would that be the same for sleeping? No. No. We, we are completely conscious when we are asleep. It wouldn't do anything to microtubules. Microtubules. It would. It would change the discussion around microtubules a great deal. I mean, how many how many scientists even know that the Fibonacci can operate in base nine? It doesn't have to operate in base ten. And when it does operate in base nine, a, a whole different worldview shows up mathematically, a completely different worldview. And it's not insignificant because. <clears throat> What people don't realize is this is what Tesla was using. This is the base of all Tesla's experiments, what he discovered. It was in base nine. He was operating in base nine. That's why he's quoted by saying, those who know the secret of the, of the three, six, nine know the secret of the universe. That's why. Phil? Yeah, can you address or uh, speak to the fact of the brain and the heart and that connection. Wow, God, Phil, you're, that's another hour, but uh, what, what I'd like, I mean, part, part of the whole, one of the discoveries that's coming out of the, the Hegelian dialectic is that <clears throat> the brain and the heart are, are not the primary connection. From a mathematical point of view, and, and using vortex mathematics, the two vibrational areas that really matter are the brain and the intestines. Mm -hmm. Yeah! that the frequency patterns between the brain and the intestines are uh, polar opposites. And guess what's in between? Yeah. In fact, oh my God, there's a whole new geometry coming out called, uh, called what is it called? Uh, uh, got too much going in my brain right now. Uh, chestahedron, chestahedron. Uh, if you get a chance, go on YouTube and look at the videos on Chestahedron. Chester. Chesterhedron. Okay. Now, he literally discovers the geometry of the heart. Com completely demythologizes it. Okay? And <clears throat> it turns out that the geometry of the heart, the vortex geometry of the heart, is based on seven. Seven. And, oh, they're, all, they're all Taurus. Uh, the head, the gut, and the heart are all Taurus. Okay? And they're literally, in that geometry, is a, is a switching between third dimension and fourth dimension with the heart. I, I mean, it's just mind-boggling. I mean, uh, there's, there's so much more that, that's going on around this whole thing. Yes. Could you explain why when someone has a near death experience they become more psychic? <sighs> I'm not a specialist on this. Uh, but I'm one of those people that was pronounced dead. And I came back. I was not happy about it. <laughs> and my world was not the same afterward. Uh, it's it's Kind of along the notion, you know, once you get them off the farm and into the city, they're no longer the same. I mean, when you experience something beyond your limits, you begin to understand there are no limits. That's what I attribute it to. Paul. You had mentioned earlier about Bruce Lupton and talking about DNA is uh, malleable. Can you say something about... Uh, how that occurs in that we map the human genome, it would sound as though it's not mutable, and yet the behavior of DNA is. Everybody hear that? All right, Here, here's the obvious thing, I mean that everybody that works with DNA is missing. Wh where has all the research on DNA occurred? In, 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 the, in the laboratory. In vitro. 
it, it, there's, there's no water around it. It turns out that water is the key aspect, the key component in DNA. No water, no DNA. They know this. So why hasn't there been more research done on DNA with the water around it? It turns out <clears throat> that the structured water in the microtubules has a direct connection to the water that surrounds the DNA. Okay? And so what they're discovering is that the DNA is not just genetic. They've discovered that it acts like an antenna. In fact, they've, they've now designed new antennas because of what they've discovered with DNA. And, and this antenna-like capability receives as well as transmits. And they've discovered that, well, I've discovered that the geometry of DNA, wow, it's the same as this. Okay, and consequently, DNA is far more, far more than what we're led to believe. Genetics is only, I would consider it, a minor component. There's a guy. <clears throat> um, well, uh, the fascinating picture of what's going on with a lot to be said for it, but I think that there, I have a couple of challenges, because I think that there could be a couple of critical things it might miss, which would allow AI to become a competing stream of evolution. Even though I believe, like you do, that the AI people are naive materialists, and that's why their prediction of when AI would happen have always been wrong, like with Vision, where Marvin Minsky at MIT in the 1960s was saying it was 10 or 15 years out, and of course HAL 9000 was supposed to have gone online in 1995. So, um, since they're naive, they continue to falsely predict uh, um, when they can make it happen and, and, and misunderstand the nature of consciousness. Oh, you hold it to one more minute. Okay. And, and this is the nature of consciousness, because there is a non-local self. But Madeline Hunt, who's a scientist at UCLA who studied human energy fields, was once asked in the context of um, abortion ethics, when she thought, based on her study of human energy fields, the psyche was incarnated in the fetus. And she said, well, um, she consulted with many sensitives, and they all seemed to feel it happened after the third trimester. Interesting implication that suggests that sufficient tissue complexity may be necessary, maybe a critical number of microtubules. But then that raises another implication, which is that possibly the materialists might create a, a sufficiently um, uh, differentiated complex network or physical substrate, and then that psyches that could be at large um, and as with the case of biological incarnation, could then choose to incarnate in that substrate. A, a slightly less <coughs> mystical version of that possibility is that from Rupert Sheldrake's idea of morphic fields, a potent morphic field would be certain principles of self-organization whereby consciousness or self-awareness happens in complex physical systems like microtubules. Suppose these patterns of self-organization then become attached to the physical substrate created by the materialists and, and then consciousness emerges as a, becomes an emergent phenomenon, as a new life form. And so therefore, um, it seems like it's hard to rule that out as a possibility. And um, I think the fact that microtubule theory cannot explain why consciousness is enhanced in an oxygen-deprived brain with NDEs suggests that it is not the root of all reality as we refer to it, but that there's a still deeper root and that it may still be um, a shade too close to materialism if it cannot account um, for that effect. And finally, one of the things that, that unites what um, Hawking says and Musk and others, and also mythologically in the culture, is they all seem to hit on an underlying archetypal mythology of the sorcerer's apprentice. That there's a sense that these naive materialists um, will open Pandora's box and something will emerge that their software and hardware never anticipated, and that that could be an underlying global intuition, a prescience, if you will, that people are having a, about this possibility. Well, Jonathan has, in one minute, given us exactly what's raging right now on this entire topic across the globe. A absolutely. <clears throat> uh, the one point that you're making, I would encourage you to take a, a full look at just the clip that I made from the YouTube interview with Hameroff. That's only four minutes. The entire interview is an hour. And Jonathan, he, he gets more in depth into some of these factors that you were bringing up. 
and you're right. I mean, he's not afraid to bring these up. And in fact, uh, he, he and Penrose have become the pit bulls on, on this whole notion, which you're calling materialistic aspect of artificial intelligence. So, uh, I mean, I concur with, the, with what you're saying, and I encourage everyone who's interested in this to pursue it further, because I, I think this is a topic we need, we need to continue discussing.